So this is a uh, kind of uh, an exploratory paper, really, because uh, uh, we got this uh, big database, which sounded quite interesting, and we wanted to do something to start using it. Uh, and <laughs> sorry, I have to be here for the TV. Uh, and um, uh, so the questions that this uh, and, and his joint work with uh, Frederic Doquier and Ilse Rusen at uh, Université Catholique de Louvain. So the question that this paper uh, starts with uh, are, I think, uh, quite deep and important questions. And uh, a lot of people, a lot of economists and policymakers would like uh, to know a little bit uh, of, uh, to, to know and understand a little bit more uh, about this issue. In particular, um, we can measure more or less how many people migrate across country with problem and with uh, uh, definitions that may vary, but how many people would migrate if they had an opportunity. And for the moment, let me leave this uh, vague. So relative to the actual flow, how big is the potential flow and uh, from where to where they would go mainly and uh, what factors uh, affect, uh, what factors that we have studied do affect migration, uh, which one of them affect the willingness uh, and the potential migration. And then uh, once uh, we, and if we can measure how many people would migrate uh, if they had an opportunity, how these potential migrants translate into actual migrants uh, and can we identify some factor that transform them into actual migrants. So um, uh, the uh, mental framework that we use in order to think about this, in order to organize this data in what is mainly a description and uh, in, uh, in a representation of the data is that uh, there is a, uh, the population of each country is a sort of uh, uh, the group of people who potentially may decide to migrate. And so we measure how many people, 25 years and older, is driven by the data constraint that we have, uh, are in the country of origin. And then we think of a potentially two-step decision First, and this is uh, likely rooted into a utility maximization, how many of them, by comparing the opportunity of living, working, or studying, or being abroad versus staying, how many would decide that for them, given their cost and benefit, they would prefer to migrate, and so these are the potential migrants. And then among this, uh, we think that this process, though, has enough, these people have enough heterogeneity, and there is enough uh, randomness and costliness in actually stumbling onto migration opportunity, out of this uh, only a certain subset uh, matches migration opportunity and does actually migrate. In fact, in a little bit more different version, in a multi-country model, you can think uh, that people can already sort themselves, uh, so there could be another intermediate step. First, you want to decide whether you might, you, in a cost-benefit analysis, you want to potentially migrate or not. And then you can decide which country gives you the highest utility of migrating, and so where do you want to migrate? And then, uh, um, again, uh, the match of this uh, subset of people who are, in a sen sense, open to or searching for migration opportunity is matched to some actual migration opportunity and they actually migrate. So you have already understood in my language that I use a utility maximization a little bit uh, language here and a matching type of, of, of language here. Uh, this, in a very broad sense, that's what we are thinking. And what we do today is a super simple framework in which we really are interested in seeing what affects this first step and what affects the second step step in, a, in an, an empirical specification which is broadly consistent with this type of idea. So the first step is what economists have, uh, so um, a lot of paper in economics are about how people maximize their utility by comparing cost and benefit of migrations and they are heterogeneous in their costs and how this maximization determines uh, the probability out of a population of a certain subset moving, migrating. So, uh, in a sense, our first step of the decision of being inside the group of potential migrants can be analyzed with the tool that economists have used to think about who would migrate. We only observe who wants to migrate rather than who actually migrates. 
And uh, if you have a random utility model in the back of your mind, uh, this form will be really a log. You will have a log, but in a linear, in a linearization of that, uh, that model will give you that the potential number of migrants of a certain skill who migrate from country O who are willing to migrate from country O to country D depends on the return that they will get in country D, on the cost that they can depend both on some fixed effect as on some bilateral effect, and on the information that they receive from country D that where information is, in a sense, uh, um, another form of costs uh, or how much do they know about the opportunity that they are there. So this is uh, what uh, economists have done uh, a lot. However, it turns out that there is also a very large non-economist literature that mainly identify this idea, this uh, as aspiring migrants. In fact, in many, in many sociological or anthropological studies, this is the focus. There is a survey where you go across people and you ask their willingness of migrating or not, and uh, um, people have analyzed what are the determinants of this. The only problem is that a lot of these studies are very specific, very country-specific, and we happen to have uh, these Gallup polls, which I will talk about, which are some polls done on representative sample on essentially all the countries in the world in which they ask this question. So our willingness to migrate will be, will come, our data, from the reply to a question in this Gallup poll that says, ideally, if you had the opportunity, would you like to move to another country or would you prefer to stay, stay in the country where you are? And if you answer yes, then there is a follow-up and they ask you, in which country would you like to, uh, 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 would you like to migrate? These uh, data are the ones that I will describe and I, we will use to create this willingness to migrate and bilateral willingness to migrate. Then, once you have this uh, potential group of migrants uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, um, tell to poll, uh, through this poll, tell that they would prefer, so in a sense, uh, revealing words that they will have a higher utility net of cost of migrating, then we're thinking that the actual flow of migrants comes from matching this potential migrant with some uh, opportunities that they have to migrate. And uh, uh, V are viable opportunities that the migrant find, and this, uh, uh, this potential set, as I said, is going to be defined for us by a country of origin and a country of destination, depending on where they say they prefer they will go. And these are characteristics or either of the country of destination, opportunity in the country of destination, but they can also depend on bilateral uh, characteristics uh, of, the, uh, of the two countries. So, in a sense, this is the idea. Then, as you will see, I sort of will linearize these two functions and I will uh, illustrate these two step pro process in a two step uh, um, estimation, a two step regression, in which we're going to see what are the determinants of potential and then, given potential, what are the determinants of the actual opportunities of migration. One thing that jumps to your eyes once you go through this data and is also clear is that people are very heterogeneous and in fact the fact that you model this flow as a percentage already tells you that people are heterogeneous. But there is one dimension in which I think you cannot ignore this and this has become very prominent in all the labor literature which is that college educated and non-college educated seems to have massively different behavior in many different uh, respects on labor market, on migration, on mobility. And so in our analysis, we will consider these as two separate groups. And we will analyze uh, for each one of them what determines their potential and their actual migration uh, behavior. Um, in particular, an interesting question that I will come back to is I will illustrate how college educated are much more likely than non-college educated to migrate. And the question is, is it because there are many more of them who are potential migrants, so the cost-benefit analysis in their mind is more favorable, and so they decide to be potential, or is it because for similar type of potential migrant, many, much fewer of them, much fewer of the less educated get an actual opportunity to migrate? So, um, the way in which we construct this, uh, uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, potential migrant, uh, um, sorry, a, a, a what we call a potential migration rate, is, as I said, that we uh, take uh, the native population in the country of origin in year 2000 as the population at risk, in a sense, or the population that can either want to migrate or actually decide to migrate. 
the actual migration rate that we are going to measure is going to be the bilateral and it is going to be constructed from actually the um, OECD uh, Chalar uh, 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 Dockier uh, data on the stock of migrants in 2010 and 2000 uh, the difference uh, um, uh, I would say something more in uh, 30 country of destination from 143 countries this uh, will be actually an actual net migration rate uh, um, uh, uh, between the country O and country B. And, uh, uh, and then we will call desire migration rate or willingness migration rate are those individuals who responded to the Gallup poll, poll that they would like to migrate. The Gallup poll were done towards the end of this, uh, we consider 2000-2010. So the migrants that we look at are the flow of people who migrate between 2000 and 2010. Gallup asked towards the end. So we consider these people who responded they are willing to migrate but obviously they are still in their country of uh, origin as uh, people who are willing but they did not migrate because they are there uh, they are still there divided by the population in year 2000 and so the potential migrant is the sum of the people who actually migrated out of the 2000 population and the people who said that they would like to migrate but they didn't out of the 2000 population and uh, this P is the potential all standardized as 2000 population this is the potential rate and this is the uh, actual rate of migration, where W, which we call willing, are people who would have liked to migrate, but they, they didn't uh, over the period that we consider. We know this uh, separately for college and non-college educated. Why do you say would have liked or not would like? Would like, would like to migrate, yes. So, so they would still like to, so these are people who would like to migrate, but they're still in the country of origin as uh, of 2010. Yes, they would like to migrate. But I've never met a net migration who would like to migrate. I'm sorry? Right. So, uh, so you are referring to the fact that this is a net and this is a gross? Well, so in a sense, we're going to try to capture a little bit uh, the long-term migrants. So if you take over 10 years, the gross migration, there is a very large number of these people uh, who are short-term migrants. Then the net variation of migrants over 10 years sort of proxies a little bit for this uh, number of migrants who migrated and didn't come back in net. So um, uh, yes, so in a sense, the observed migrants are this net measure. This is, so if you like, the potential is a stock, are all the people who uh, want to migrate, out of which uh, this uh, subset does migrate, and this subset did, migrate, subset did migrate in the period 2000 2010, and this did not migrate in the period 2000 2010. And so when we aggregate them, we get the potential migrant. And when we consider just uh, the net, we are going to call these uh, uh, migrants. Um, uh, the country, so as I said, uh, the data set has 143 countries of origin and 30 destinations. And the 30 destinations are uh, destinations that uh, um, uh, receive the majority of migrants in the world. In fact, um, uh, according to the UN, about two thirds of the migrants in the world goes to these, two thir these 30 destinations and more than 80% of the highly skilled. In terms of desired migration, re revealed by the Gallup poll, uh, these 30 countries would uh, receive uh, uh, almost 85% uh, uh, of uh, uh, all migrants, all uh, people interviewed in this country, 85% of them say that we would like to go, uh, they would like to go in these countries. So the first uh, figure that I want to show is uh, uh, just to give you an idea of, uh, the, uh, of the comparison between the net migration uh, the desire than the potential migration and then what was the stock of migrants. So the first thing that jumps to your eyes is that the net actual migration, so uh, this is the percentage of people and it's always divided between non-college and college, uh, there is a 10 time larger migration rate of college educated relative to non-college and about 4% of uh, uh, college educated uh, uh, from these 143 countries uh, migrated in these 10 years. Uh, the percentage of people who said who they wanted to migrate uh, and uh, uh, they're still there is this. So the potential rate, the total people uh, who either wanted or did migrate is uh, about 9% for the less educated and about 20% for the college educated. Now what you notice is that while there is a still a skill bias in people who wanted to migrate and in the total potential migrants, it's much smaller than the skill bias in the actual migrants. So potential migrants is almost one to two. So 
44 percent, uh, uh, sorry, the, the ratio between potential non-collagen, collagen 44, while the ratio between the actual is uh, uh, one tenth of uh, uh, non-collagen educated to actual migrate. This is from the point of view of the sending country. This is all standardized by the population of the sending country, which is how we will do the analysis. But if you're interested in what would be the consequence of this potential migrant in the receiving country, then here we give this a uh, couple of other statistics. So in terms of net migrant over those 10 years, as a percentage of the population of the 30 receiving country, you see that again, the receiving country received the skill bias or college bias inflow of immigrant, 6% uh, increase in, in their college population and 2.4 in their non-college. But if all workers who say that they would want, or people who would want to migrate, did migrate, then now you would have an inflow of migrants in the rich country, which is unskilled bias. And the reason is that, while from the country point of view there are still more college educated who want to migrate, there are so many more non-college educated in the world who want to go essentially in the rich, in this uh, 30 country, that uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you calculate the potential migrants, they are, uh, th their migration will be significantly un unskilled. Uh, bias. Now, uh, as I will show you, these potential migrants are by no means, uh, uh, I think, uh, a number which is going to be easy to achieve in any way. So it's hard to think of these people who say that they would migrate uh, as people that under reasonable cir circumstances will all go to the country. We'll discuss this, but this is just uh, a bit of general figure. Yes? So uh, you're right. Uh, given that we we, we uh, so um, uh, all the regression that we did, we either uh, lo uh, looked at potential or desired uh, to look at the effect in both cases. Really, what drives all the effect of the potential is what is in the desired because it's so much larger. And so ultimately, all the results that uh, I'm going to show you uh, are going to hold both if I talk about just desired migrant or potential migrants. And the reason why we do this is because really there is this uh, little bit of time mismatch between when the question are asked and when we observe a migrant. And so we, are pro we tend to consider this as an exposed revelation. But if it was an ex ante revelation, then you're right. We should have done the other way. We do the other way. So the first observation, as I said, is that there is a much larger uh, uh, college bias in uh, the actual migration than in the potential or in the desired migration. And uh, uh, the other message from this general number is that uh, it's very different if you consider the skill bias from the country of origin or the country of destination. In fact, potential migrants look unskilled, bi uh, look unskilled bias from the destination point of view. Now, um, do this number these numbers are much larger, so potential and uh, uh, desire migration are much larger than the actual one, 10 times larger, 15 times larger. But do they correlate at all with the actual migration? Do they have any pre predictive uh, uh, value? So this is just to see what is the uh, list of the receiving countries, which has a bunch of large OECD countries. It also has the Russian Federation, though, and it has the Gulf country, the big uh, United uh, Emirates, Saudi Arabia, so the big receiver in the Gulf country. And uh, this is the database which is uh, expanding, as we have heard, uh, so one could add other, um, uh, other countries. So um, again, uh, is uh, uh, this revealed preference for migration uh, a predictor of actual migration in uh, uh, this country? And again, I'm going to show you some chart from the sending country point of view, from the receiving, and then we will start using the bilateral uh, dimension of this to go a little bit more uh, uh, in detail in at least describing some of the correlates. Uh, and also, yes, so are they predictor and is, is this uh, correlation different for college and non-college educated? So here, if you plot the potential immigration rate on the horizontal axis and the actual immigration rate on the vertical axis, and you plot it by receiving country, so this is standardized by the receiving country population, you see that uh, there is a clear positive and very significant correlation in both cases. But if you already look uh, at the coefficient and you look at the R square, for college educated potential uh, immigration, pa uh, immigration potential seems to predict much better the actual immigration, while for non-college educated, uh, uh, the uh, correlation is there, but seems to be much less precise, much more uh, scattered. 
Now, um, this is from the receiving country point of view. This is just uh, for the flows. And this is just to uh, give you what are the top countries in terms of as immigration as a percentage of their, uh, uh, of their population. What would be the top country if all potential uh, if, uh, migrants will become actual migrants? And so we get that Canada, Switzerland, for instance, will have a very large inflow. There are a lot of people who will go to Switzerland, while Switzerland received in those 10 years a very small um, uh, amount of uh, actual uh, high skilled migrants. Uh, while among the non college Saudi Arabia is very high, so uh, the Gulf country will be uh, very high, and uh, the United States uh, and the other uh, Anglo Saxon are also relatively high. Now, from the sending country point of view, things are even more striking, in a sense. From the sending, ca sending country point of view, um, uh, the correlation between uh, potential and actual uh, migration is very strong and very tight, especially if we include some outliers, but even if we cut those outliers, uh, they are pretty large for uh, uh, college educated. For non-college educated, the correlation is uh, uh, there, is positive, but not, is not as uh, tight. In fact, here, it seems almost that uh, from the any country point of view, the correspondence between potential and actual migrants uh, among college educated is really very tight, so the coefficient is 0 0.93. Um, and this is the correlation of the flows. So uh, again, just to show a couple of maps here before going uh, into a little bit more systematic analysis. So this is a representation of the actual emigration rate of college educated. So as we know, a big brain drain out of Africa in part of Latin America, the Middle East, uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, and this is the migration rate of non-college educated. Similar, but for instance, see, uh, Mexico becomes much uh, larger when we, uh, when we look at non-college educated. In fact, this is the one exception in which uh, a lot of the uh, migrants are really less educated. And also there is a quite strong uh, uh, migration of less educated from uh, uh, Eastern Europe. And then if you just spot the world, if, you, if we do the same for potential migration uh, of college educated and non-college educated, they're pretty correlated. So in a sense, uh, um, people, um, they, if you think about this, uh, so there is uh, some information which is extracted through these polls, and this uh, seems to be uh, pretty strongly correlated with the actual measure of migration over these 10 years. So again, this is just to uh, emphasize how that correlation that we saw, even in terms of areas of the world which would have a high migration under the potential, they will be sort of the same, that, we, that already have high migration under uh, uh, actual, but the numbers are much larger, right? So you, I didn't point down here the rate. Uh, so here the top rate are 0.2%, so 0.2% of the population over 10 years, and here the rates are 66% or 23% uh, in the top range. So much larger, but the same structure. So uh, here, let's do some, uh, 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 let's, let's show a few of the uh, potential correlates. So what we thought is, let's uh, start, the easy thing to do is to consider now this uh, um, potential uh, uh, to uh, migration rate between country O and D, and use some of the standard and simple determinants that people have used in a, a gravity-like equation, although this is a really linear on linear. We tried... Uh, a, a good half a dozen of specification. The natural thing is to look at the logs over here, uh, uh, logs on logs or logs on level. Uh, uh, again, if you follow, um, if you have followed a little bit the Hanson and Borja's debate on war, uh, on the Roy debate on what is the right specification. Here, given the nature of this paper, that we want to really uh, look at what are the effect. We keep linear effect. This is obviously a linear approximation of whatever the relation is, and we just uh, are going to comment on some of these uh, uh, coefficients. So, uh, as bare bone type of uh, determinant we put uh, the um, so first of all we always put uh, a set of country of origin fixed effect so in this uh, uh, 143 country of origin this is a bila is a bilateral cross section so and again uh, bilateral cross section is not good to identify caus causally anything and so take this uh, uh, as a, um, a relationship for uh, uh, ability to predict uh, this is the uh, country per cap the out GDP per capita in destination, and this is the employment uh, population ratio in destination. This uh, is a set of uh, variables uh, that include uh, um, all the standard variables that people put in to proxy uh, uh, geography, cultural, and institutional distance, including genetic, including common language, the border, the colonial tie, 
uh, relationship. And then, um, uh, uh, and then we also wanted to see if this potential migration was affected by what we call uh, um, some network measures. So the network measure standardly put in is how, what is the stock of migrants from the bilateral relationship at the beginning of the period. We also include from these Gallup polls, there is also a question on do you have a member of the household who's abroad? So the share of people in the origin country who have a household member who's abroad. In light of the presentation that I've seen here uh, that uh, Jacqueline gave, we can think of this uh, as uh, sort of weak ties with people who are from your nationality and strong ties with people who are from actually your family and they are uh, uh, in the country of destination. Then, uh, obviously, sort of the whole, uh, the goal of all this is to try to understand what policies do to migration. And so, in this type of analysis, though, what we think is that people are comparing costs and, and benefits, and certainly economic factor affect benefits, certainly geography and history uh, affect bilateral cost, and network can also do it. But these two policies should not affect very much the cost and benefit of migrating, should affect the opportunity of migrating for people who would like to migrate. So here we put such just a dummy for two countries who have a free labor mobility agreement, which is some subset of European countries. And uh, countries, uh, and a dummy one, equal, uh, equal to one for, vis for countries which have a uh, uh, visa waiver agreement, so that you can visit each other without uh, a, a visa. This is uh, um, a variable that um, Simone has used and other few people have used it. Yeah. So simple policies here. And uh, let me go through some results uh, and tell you a little bit. So, First, I uh, will always separate between college educated and non-college educated, so just let, me, let me point out. First of all, the network effect is always very strong, this is nothing new, but it seems that even when you control for this uh, uh, stock of migrants, uh, the previous stock of migrants, uh, the strong ties add a very strong effect. We standardize those by one standard deviation. So this means that an increase of the stock of people who have a relative abroad by one standard deviation increases the migration rate by 0 0.87 percentage point. I will show you the quantitative what it means. So very strong effect both for educated network effect and for non-educated, oh sorry, for college educated and non-college educated. And the coefficients are, are roughly similar up here and stronger on the tie with a member of the household uh, in, uh, uh, for college educated. Um, these are different specifications, and I boxed this one, which control for all the geography, uh, and uh, um, I will say a couple of uh, things more, but focus on essentially, uh, uh, yes, this, this column has one pretty complete. Uh, then if you look at the income, the income per capita and the employment population ratio and destination, it has a very positive and very significant uh, effect. And if you look at the coefficient, the impact is uh, similar both for college educated, uh, for non-college educated and for college educated. This is interesting. It means that uh, college and non-college educated in terms of potential willingness to migrate, they respond similarly to these economic things. We should enter in their cost and benefit analysis. So if they are rational, they should. The slightly higher coefficient for college educated would be consistent with the idea that they have a larger premium uh, in uh, a richer country. Uh, if you include the growth rate over this 10 year of the GDP per capita, that doesn't have very much effect. That makes sense. People who want to migrate compare the level and the United States is a very good destination to go even in a decade for a person from Mexico or uh, from Mozambique, even in a decade where the United States doesn't matter, doesn't grow very fast. So the level comparison for this cost benefit analysis is a little bit better proxy of the present discounted value that you will get from migration. Then if you focus on the, on the mobility, on the, free, on the policy variable, they don't seem to have any effect on uh, determining potential migration, neither for high nor for low educated. Again, in line with the idea that uh, then we're going to see if they have an impact on the actual uh, po po of potential and possibility of migrating, but uh, they don't seem to affect the cost. So the question is, if you had the opportunity, would you go? And so this implies a cost-benefit analysis, but uh, this, uh, this variable affects the probability of the opportunity. Once you have the opportunity, uh, uh, they shouldn't affect very much uh, uh, your behavior. So just to give you uh, a quantitative assessment, a little bit of what I said, the average migration rate, so there are 30 countries of destination, the average migration, emigration rate is for college educated 0.71 and for non-college educated 0.49, the average potential education uh, uh, migration rate. And so the effect of, of, uh, of uh, uh, income per capita destination is very big. Uh, an additional $10,000 per capita, which is the difference between the UK and the US, as a destination increases by 0.30% the probability 
probability of migrating of college and by 20 of non-college compared to an average of 71, so it's big. Uh, 10 more percentage point of employment rate at destination increase uh, the probability of college educated by 0.10 and non-college educated 0.05. And the network also, one standard deviation increases by 2%, so very large for college and 1% for non-college. So this uh, effect, this uh, matches a little bit our expectation from a utility maximization. This is very important, uh, as uh, these two are very important. The network uh, help uh, reduce the cost, uh, and so we are in the right direction. There we go, a bunch of robustness check, and uh, uh, that I will uh, spare. The second part of it uh, is uh, here. Uh, so now what if we estimate uh, this uh, matching, uh, uh, sort of this uh, uh, second step in which we include as one of the determinants of the actual migration rate, the potential migration rate, and then we include here factors that we think may have an, an effect in generating opportunity for uh, migrant during the decades that we are analyzing, which is the 2000-2010 uh, period. In particular, this is, and we test this, um, why we think that the level of income per capita is important in determining the present discounted value and so in determining the potential of migrants, we thought that the growth rate of income per capita over this 10-year period and the growth of the employment rate over this 10-year period could have been a better, uh, a better proxy or a better determinant of the actual opportunity in order to have when you have people who are willing to migrate in order to have opportunity at destination, this opportunity come when you have potentially a productivity growth that generates more income per capita and more employment. And then we want to see if some of the policy have uh, impact. And also, uh, in this, I'm not going to show it, we also include in this uh, all the bilateral geography cultural uh, uh, characteristics uh, that we included before because they could also have an effect on the uh, matching. Uh, I never show the coefficient on those, I'm happy to uh, show them because it's hard to change the geography and these things, it's important to control, but we wanted to show something on which we could say something uh, a little bit uh, policy relevant. And always country of origin uh, fixed effect in uh, this estimate. So here what we get is uh, um, the effect uh, of the, so this is the, for the non-college educated, um, the effect of, uh, um, the, the first is what is the coefficient on the potential immigration. So this is probably the most uh, interesting uh, uh, effect we find. So the potential immigration uh, affects very significantly the actual immigration, <laughs> but if you look at the coefficient here, it's very small for non-college educated. Out of one person who wants to migrate, so out of 1% uh, um, a, a potential migration rate, only 0.046% actually do migrate. And uh, the GDP at destination seems to be an important determinant also of the actual. So obviously, remember, the potential immigration in here uh, is affected by the level of the GDP at uh, destination, but the growth seems to affect this. In fact, if you include as a control the real GDP per person in level on the opportunity, this doesn't seem to be very uh, significant, but the growth, so opportu new opportunity come with growth for migrating, new matching opportunity, but uh, the size of this pool increases with uh, the uh, size of the uh, wage difference. And, um, and then uh, if you look at the uh, policy variables, so um, they have actually an effect which is most of the time significant, but really small in size. In fact, uh, for instance, this free mobility uh, dummy, 0.01 means that uh, between country otherwise equal or country pairs, two countries which have a free labor mobility agreement have a 0.01 percentage point higher probability of, uh, uh, of uh, um, uh, actual migration, uh, controlling for potential migration over there. Remember, these were not significant in the potential. They are significant now, but their, their point estimate is quite small uh, uh, and uh, is quite small. Not only is quite small, but when it's significant, uh, it's significant only for the low skilled. For the high skilled, uh, uh, the story is a little bit different. These policy variables are not, don't seem to have any correlation. However, what is really much larger, as we would expect, is the ability of potential migrant to find opportunity, no matter for what we control, really. So this is the puzzle a little bit that we hit, and I will go a little bit more, is that no matter how many control we put here, highly educated seems to always have, always have a significantly larger, so 0.04 was the probability of converting a potential low skill, uh, and 0.13 is the pro probability of converting a high skill from potential to Actual migrant. Giovanni, yes. So have you tried the interaction between the policy variables and the potential 
Thank you for the question. So um, I don't know if it's next slide, but it's coming up in, 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 in two seconds. So then we do a few more things. So that's right. So in fact, in particular, in the linear specification, we didn't really uh, believe. So let me read this. But we really wanted to see how these things interact, because in the linear, you don't. So just quantitatively, the thing that seems to matter most when you do this regression is really uh, the uh, potential migration. Ah, by the way, sorry, I didn't uh, talk a little too much about the network effect. Once you control, remember the network had a huge effect on potential immigration. One, uh, you control for this, the networks uh, also seems to be very little, uh, seems to have uh, uh, very little impact on transforming uh, potential into actual. So this is the, the biggest uh, sort of strong and robust result uh, there. There is uh, some effect of growth of GDP per person at destination uh, on, uh, on, uh, the, uh, on, on uh, uh, probability of converting. So this is the economic factor that seems to affect. And the, uh, the geographic and the network effect seems to be much less relevant. So before going and doing interaction and a couple of other things that uh, I want to show, let me just show one experiment. So one experiment is we have no idea what determines this massive difference, or we think that is policy that determines this massive difference in the probability that a willing, highly ed college educated becomes an actual and uh, uh, versus a low educated. By putting in policy variable, we cannot find anything, but it could be that our policy variable are really bad. Uh, for the moment, let us say, what if we would change policy, policies in the world so that we give to the low skilled, to the non-college educated, the same probability of becoming, educate, of becoming actual migrant than the college educated? How would this change the inflow or the potential uh, immigrant, low skilled immigrant in several countries? So you have some countries in which uh, this change will have a massive effect. Uh, Saudi Arabia will go from 20, so the percentage of their uh, low skilled education, but even um, but even Switzerland, for instance, which had a very small inflow of uh, uh, immigrants in the low skill group in these 10 years, would have a tripled level of them. And uh, uh, in many of them, you will have an increase by two or three uh, order of magnitude of the less educated coming into this country if one could implement such a thing. Then, um, of course, we have a linear specification and nothing tells us that those relationships are linear. So at the very least, let's allow the marginal effect of potential immigrant to vary with the different characteristics of the receiving country. Does the potential immigrant interact with the growth at destination? Does the potential, immigrant, the potential immigrant interact with the policy at destination? And does the potential immigrant interact with the presence of network at destination by us, some more explanatory power, or uh, present some uh, significant correlation with uh, uh, this, with the uh, uh, with, uh, actual migration? And uh, the results uh, are that uh, the only variable that seems uh, uh, really to matter is the interaction between the potential and the GDP growth uh, at destination. So again, this uh, says that if a country at destination, well, I'll give you an example in the next uh, variable. So it seems essentially to say that a country that has uh, uh, is a large potential number of immigrants who are willing to go to the United States, when the United States growth will have a larger inflow, a, a larger outflow towards the United States relative to a country who has a small group of people who would want to go to the United States. So this uh, almost it seems uh, it makes sense that there should be some interaction. And uh, the place where we find a significant interaction, and by the way, only for the college the non-college educated is this. When we interact, uh, the, uh, when we interact uh, the policy variable with the, uh, with the pot potential, we only find that this goes in and out sometimes of significant in effect for the visa waiver, and again, only for the less educated. And when we interact uh, the actual presence of a, of a network with this uh, uh, potential immigrant, uh, we don't have an effect. Keep in mind, again, that the stock of people affected a lot the potential, right? So there is a massive effect of having a network on the people who will want to go to that country. But once you control for that, then the extra effect here seems to be uh, very small. Um, so uh, just to give you an idea of what this interaction means, uh, to, to put it in number, India is a country where the people 
say there is a much larger uh, percentage of people that says that they want to migrate to the US and then migrate to Spain. So if the US and Spain have an increase in growth in GDP per capita of 1.5, this will translate in a larger migration from India to the United States by 0.027 percentage point, which uh, on an average of 0.7 is uh, small but not trivial, and essentially no effect uh, this faster growth of Spain economy will not have any uh, appreciable effect on the migration from India to Spain. Um, another thing that we wanted to take a look at, uh, because we thought uh, it could also illustrate a little bit uh, uh, if this is an issue of, uh, uh, of policy without actually measuring policies, uh, which so, so on the policy side, we can discuss. In this paper, we decided that all the measures that we had previously built of policy in this country, uh, they received a massive criticism. We're waiting for the Impala numbers. And so we only took some very simple policies. But uh, in a sense, there is another way of looking at this, which is do people who migrate from poor country to rich country, are they significantly different, uh, both uh, in their potential and in their and in their actual. So is it that people who come from poor countries they have a significantly lower probability of being admitted into rich, into um, this 30 migration country um, uh, uh, once we control for the potential uh, migrants. Uh, so what we do uh, here is we run again the same specification. Uh, and again, we can look at uh, uh, the middle one here and here for less educated and college educated. And, uh, uh, and uh, if you remember, this is uh, uh, the percentage of potential translating into actual. This is only potential from uh, the, poor, the, the poor country, the one defined outside of uh, Europe uh, and North America. So we throw out, and uh, uh, Japan, Australia. We throw out these uh, 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 rich countries and we look at everybody else. And if you remember the coefficient that we estimated was around 0.04 in the total sample. And here was around 0.18 in the total sample. So it doesn't seem sig significantly different, uh, the percentage of potential migrants that translate into actual migrants. But clearly, there is a still this massive difference between uh, highly educated, college educated, and non-college educated. So it seems that this bias towards college educated immigrant is not particularly stronger for immigrant once you decide the potential, control for the potential for immigrant that come from richer than from poorer country, but is present across the board. Uh, here, the wi visa waiver dummy is the one that we also thought it could bite. A lot of people uh, um, uh, point at the fact that the visa waiver allow people from poor country to come in a, in, a, in a country more easily, in a rich country, and then a lot of them find employment, regularize themselves, uh, stay undocumented for a while. And so we wanted to see if we found a, a stronger effect. And it, actually, we find that this visa waiver dummy has a, a sort of a shift, an effect of shifting the probability away from uh, high college educated into uh, non-college educated uh, migration. So countries that have these bilateral visa agreements uh, seem, uh, to, uh, seem to encourage a little bit uh, uh, for controlling for potential the actual migration or low skilled. But uh, as a um, consequence or as an other effect, they decrease the immigration of their high skill. So there are uh, uh, many other things uh, that uh, one can do with this data. We started from this uh, uh, sort of relatively simple framework and relatively simple um, way of analyzing it. And uh, um, uh, I think we, uh, it's sort of what we are going next is to make a little bit more formal the first utility. And with the random utility maximization, we just need to modify. We didn't go right away. The log specification got us uh, some results that we, uh, that, that, that we need still to understand a little bit. So that that's why we went with the linear. But I think that's the next step of having a framework which does random utility maximization at the first stage and maybe formalizes a little bit more the matching in the second stage. Um, but I think the message here is seem to be that if you just take this potential migration data, um, uh, the way in which we used to uh, treat the migration data, a lot of the variable that affected those, uh, uh, those uh, gravity re regression, uh, affected the migration rate uh, uh, in the gravity regression, seemed to work through the potential. Once you know the potential, uh, migration rate is much harder to predict, or we couldn't find among our correlates anything that robustly correlates with the, the possibility of transforming potential into actual. So that's maybe where measuring policies precisely, measuring opportunity precisely is very important. One thing is sure, 
the, this percentage is very, very, is three times larger or four times larger for college educated and non, for non-college educated. And that's where the big skill bias of actual migration come in uh, the regression that we normally run without knowing the potential, uh, the potential uh, migrants. Um, uh, uh, let me uh, say one cautionary note on all this uh, is that, uh, um, so in a sense, it's very interesting to look at potential migration and is, uh, this a survey that asks people, would you like to migrate or not, uh, are interesting because they reveal something about those people, but especially if these people are really non-college educated, then this, uh, this measurement may have a very, very small connection with uh, really very, very small predictive power with their actual probability of uh, uh, migration. And uh, uh, one thing that I didn't, uh, I didn't discuss here, and again, I'm uh, happy, is that uh, um, uh, maybe people don't have a, such a specific bilateral preference. They have a preference for migrate, and then it's a little bit more random where they end up. And so we run some regression uh, at the country of origin level aggregating all of them, and most of the results uh, uh, are robust, even if you don't include the bilateral uh, effect. You can control for much less. And as I said, I think at this point we have as many, uh, as many uh, sort of avenue to explore as questions in looking at this. I think this is an interesting decomposition and way of thinking about this data, but certainly the potential are big and certainly uh, we'll, we'll be working more on this. <laughs>